So I think we are recording now. I should probably go ahead and get started so we don't run out of time because we only have about 40 minutes to do this. Hi everybody, I'm Adrian. I'm the lactation consultant here at Vitality Natural Medicine and I'm here to talk today a little bit about um, breastfeeding and returning to work or school outside the home um, because it is a pretty big topic and a lot of uh, families have a lot of questions about it um, because we don't have maternity leave here in the United States. Um, so a lot of um, parents end up going back to work much sooner than they would like to or that they should. Um, so in order to be able to continue the breastfeeding relationship when returning to work outside the home, you are going to have to express your breast milk um, and store it and feed it to your baby. A caregiver will have to do that. Um, so I just kind of wanted to cover a few different topics. Um, basically like the most common questions that I hear about people returning to work, um, the things that people want to know the most. Um, and then if you guys have any questions, um, I believe that you guys can chat me and I should be able to see the questions um, and then we can, uh, I can go through them that way. Um, we might want to do a test of the question chatting, just so I know that it's working. Haven't ever used the system before, so <laughs> I'm learning how to do it. Um, okay. Uh, okay, so a question about reverse cycling. Yeah, I can certainly talk about that, uh, because that is that's, you know, I'll, yeah, I'll start by talking about that one just because it is one of the first things that um, parents notice when they do return to work is um, the baby starts sleeping all day and not taking any of their breast milk in the bottle or in the sippy cup or what have you, and is then waking up all night. Um, and so a lot of people will be like, oh, my baby's sleeping all day and is not eating, and uh, what do I do about that? Because now they are up all night. And um, it's called reverse cycling, and it's because babies are smart, and they know that uh, usually mom is the, is the breastfeeding partner, and they know that mom is home at night, and so they basically will kind of like conserve all of their energy during the day and maybe they'll sleep a lot. Maybe they won't take any bottles at daycare or for the nanny or the, the parent who's home or what have you. Um, and then they make up for it all night. So um, my best advice for when that situation happens is to co-sleep. You know, I think that's the best way that people seem to get rest is by co-sleeping and just knowing that it's a phase and that it's going to end eventually. Some babies will kind of like get into the rhythm and the habit of going, you know, being home with the caregiver during the day and then they know mom comes home and they just kind of become accustomed to it. And so sometimes they won't feel like they have to wake up just to be with mom um, as they get a little bit older. So reverse cycling is a, it's a real bummer. And I, I've had a lot of parents ask me about it. Um, and there's not really like a ton to be done about it other than just yeah, hang in there and know that it will get better. Um, okay, so I would say that the next most common question I hear uh, when moms or parents are planning to go back to work is how much is my baby supposed to eat while I'm away? And there's a pretty good rule of thumb for how to, um, how to calculate that. And it's basically you want to think of that for every um, hour that you are separated from your baby, you want to have about an ounce of milk. So say you have, you know, an eight hour work day, and then you have your, you know, a commute on either end of that, and you'll be gone for about nine hours. You want to leave approximately um, nine ounces of milk for the baby. Um, and I would recommend doing probably like two to three ounce bottles at a time. And uh, because babies aren't going to need mo much more than that. Um, in a bottle, never more than four ounces, really, um, because their stomachs just can't hold that much. Um, so you're going to be, the caregiver will be better off giving small, like, frequent bottles than, like, one giant bottle um, over that time. So one ounce per hour is about what you want to be aiming for when you're, when you're planning um, how much milk to be sending to the caregiver um, when you're returning to work. 
Um, let's see. So when you are at work, you're obviously going to need to express your milk. One, to maintain your milk supply because milk supply is supply and demand and you have to, if the baby's not there to demand the milk, then you have to use your pump to do so in order to supply it. Um, and two, to avoid a breast infection, obviously. We don't want mastitis to happen, um, which is an infection in your breast that happens if the milk sits for too long. Um, and it can make you pretty sick. So you definitely want to avoid that. Um, so when you are at work, um, say you have a pretty typical, you know, nine hour day, maybe a 12 hour shift. If you, you know, say like work in the hospital or something, you will probably want to pump about every three hours or so. Um, lots of breastfeeding parents will try to mimic kind of what their baby does. Like if they know baby eats every, you know, two and a half to three hours, they, they try to do that at work. Um, you probably don't want to go more than three hours, though. Um, one, your breasts will start to probably get kind of uncomfortable and painful, and that does start to put you at risk for reducing your milk supply and also um, for breast infection. Um, here in Oregon and in most states, um, there are laws that require employers to give um, breastfeeding parents time to express milk. Um, Oregon law requires that employers give um, 30 minute, a 30 minute rest break for milk expression. And so you can um, split that up throughout the day. You don't, you're not going to be like taking one 30 minute break and only pumping once. You'll, you'll want to divide that up. Um, you of course can also use your um, lunch break and your, your uh, paid breaks that are by law required. They have to give you additional time to pump though. It doesn't have to be paid. Um, so they can give you 30 minutes of unpaid. You can use your 10 minute breaks to pump and you can use your lunch as well. Um, let's see. If you're having problems with your employers, I would strongly encourage you to have them look into the laws about that because they are on your side as the breastfeeding mother or parent. You, the law is on your side to protect yourself. Um, in that regards. And I've seen it happen a lot. I've seen a lot of employers um, either just not know or not ever had to have dealt with it before. And so they, um, they don't know what they're supposed to be doing and providing for um, breastfeeding parents. So it may be on you to teach them. And sometimes that can, you know, be an, an awkward conversation, but it, uh, it's an important one. So stand up for yourself if you're not being given breaks, if you are not being given a space to pump, you're gonna need a private area. I believe the law has to give, um, there has to be a space for you to express your breast milk that is private. Um, it doesn't, I believe it doesn't have to have a lock, but it should, obviously. Uh, and um, it has to be clean, it can't be a bathroom. They're not allowed to force you to pump in a bathroom. Um, so washing your pump parts. So when you're pumping at work, you are going to obviously have to have a lot of um, tools with you. You're going to need your pump, your flanges, your um, the little connectors, the little membranes. There's lots of like little tiny pieces. And then obviously um, a collection like storage bottles to collect the milk. Um, all of those things don't need to be washed every single time that you pump. If you have a healthy full-term baby and uh, the baby's not sick or immunocompromised, you can leave it um, sitting on your desk. If it's room temperature, if it's 98 degrees outside like it is today, then then you'll want to at least put it in the, in the refrigerator. But if it's just at standard room temperature, you can leave it sitting out. Um, or you can rinse it just in the kind of in between pump sessions. You can just rinse it too. Um, or you can just stick it in the fridge uh, in between your pump sessions if that is an option for you. Um, when I was pumping at a previous job that I had when my child was breastfeeding, I would just put, I had a little mini fridge in my office and I would just put the breastfeeding, all the pump stuff in the fridge with the breast milk. Um, and then you just wash it at the end of the day, you know, um, just warm soapy water. A lot of dishwashers are, a lot of pump parts are dishwasher safe. So um, it doesn't have to be done a ton of times, you know, during, like during the day. So don't, don't use your, if you only have limited amount of time to be pumping during the day because you have to get back to work, don't worry about, you know, using your time to meticulously wash it with soap and water and all those things. Um, you can just do that at the end of the day. When you are pumping, 
Um, there's something called hands-on pumping, and that is, I'm reaching for my model here. That is, it's basically exactly what it sounds like. Um, a way to yield more milk while pumping is to be using your hands to do kind of like breast massage while pumping, right? And this is my, my little model to show you guys kind of what I'm talking about. Um, so this is why I recommend also using like a hands-free pumping bra because doing this motion is a lot easier to do if you're not having to hold the flanges on it, which I wish I, wish I had some, but I don't think I do. Um, so a hands-free pumping bra can be a sports bra that you just cut holes into um, that you can put your, your flanges into uh, that way, or you can get one of the kind of like bustier ones that uh, they sell at Toys R Us or at Babies R Us or places like that. Um, so then you're able to like really get some good breast compression going while you're pumping and a lot of moms or a lot of parents don't respond super well to the pump just in general and so this can be a way to help with that. Um, let's see. What other questions do people usually have? I know um, it can be really daunting when you are pumping and it seems like you're not pumping very much. I know a lot of parents start to freak out if they only see like a couple of ounces at a time. Um, especially when you're using those, you know, storage collections that are like, you know, at least four or five ounces. In general, you're probably not going to um, be pumping five ounces from each breast at a time. That That is not common and not necessary. So I would say the biggest thing that I, that I would recommend is to encourage you not to be looking at the pump as an indicator of your supply. I tell this to families all the time that the pump is an indicator of how much you can pump, not how much milk you're making. Because in general, babies are better at removing milk than pumps are. Uh, we respond better to our babies than we do machines. So if you're not getting a ton of milk while you're pumping, don't worry about it. It's not going to be worth stressing out about because it's not an indicator of your milk supply. And if you're only pumping when you're away from your baby and you guys are nursing every time you're together, so like in the evening, at night, in the morning, on the weekends, on your days off, your milk supply is going to be just fine. Um, another question I get a lot is about how much milk do I have to have stored before I go back to work? I um, I see moms of newborns who are already, you know, starting to worry about going back to work and they, you know, their baby's a week old and they're like, okay, well, should I start pumping now to start saving up? And, you know, I don't have like a hard and fast yes or no, but in general, I tend to leave that one to, you know, let's, let's worry about that when we get closer to it. Um, because you don't need to have a giant freezer stash before you go to work. We have, our culture puts a lot of emphasis on the freezer stash. Um, we always want to be like, oh, I got to keep the freezer full. I got to have tons of milk in there. I got to have tons of extras. And the reality is, is all you need is what you need for the next day, right? So if you are planning to go back to work, you don't have to have 60 ounces in the freezer because your baby's not gonna eat 60 ounces that first day, right? Um, I do encourage you to try pumping and to start getting into the habit of figuring out how to do it, putting your parts together, experimenting with what yields the most milk. Um, you should do that before you go back to work, certainly. Um, but your maternity leave is meant to be used for, you know, getting to know your baby and spending time together, right? Um, so I don't like it. I don't like when families feel like they have to stress out about pumping and, you know, teaching the baby to take a bottle and all those things when your number one job is to be like bonding with your, with your baby. So I, I, I would, I would recommend that you have milk in your freezer before you go back to work, but it doesn't have to be this huge, crazy amount that, that, you know, is, you know, filled to the brim. Right. So that's something to think about. Remember that that first day back, you just have to have enough milk to get them through that first day, right? And then that day, you'll be pumping what they're gonna be getting the next day. So, um, let, let's see, okay. What about when baby flies through what I've left for the care provider? Oh, that's a great question. So, 
This is one that I hear a lot. I one time read about a mom who said that her nanny blew through a third of her freezer stash on the first day of work. And I don't know how much her freezer stash was, but whatever it was, a third of it is probably more than the baby needed. So it's also super, super common for caregivers to not know how to give a baby a bottle. And that's, it's not a judgment by any means. It's that if you're never like taught how to do it and, you know, based on what we see on television, it's, of course, you're going to, you know, not have the information about it. So what I like to recommend is called paste bottle feeding. And uh, I have a blog about it, a blog post on the Vitality Northwest website. Um, and it's a method of giving a bottle that makes it so the baby can pace themselves and um, figure out when they're full. And so if you're taking a bottle and you're just kind of dumping it into the baby's mouth, like if they're, say, laying flat like this, and I don't have, oh, I left my bottles at home. I don't have a baby doll here. <laughs> but if you're um, dumping it into, their, into them this way, they're laying flat, right, kind of like this, and then the gravity is just doing all the work, right? And then the baby's just going to be passively swallowing, and they're not going to be um, learning how to like they're just going to be swallowing to breathe, right? They're not going to be learning how to like kind of recognize when their when their brain and their stomach are starting to connect that they're full. Um, so with pace bottle feeding, they're sitting they're sitting upright, like you have them kind of in the crook of your arm, and then you're holding the bottle horizontally, and they have to latch onto the bottle the way that they would the breast. Um, and then you kind of, you keep a half full of milk and then you kind of just let them sort of suckle at the bottle the way that they would the breast. And then you give them breaks, you know, you, you, you tip the bottle down, you give them some breaks so they can kind of breathe and catch up. And then by doing it this way, they're not going to overfeed themselves. They're not going to overeat um, because they're able to recognize when their tummy is full. It also minimizes spitting up. Um, and it avoids that concern about when the care provider is, you know, burning through that milk and they say you didn't leave enough milk and then moms start to worry that they're not making enough milk because the baby's eating six ounces all at once um so it's really important to educate caregivers about this and you as as the breastfeeding individual are probably going to be the one that has to do that and that's okay it's fine it's just it's important information to have and it's kind of one of those things that if you don't know about it then you don't know to ask about it so it's pretty important to let whoever is giving your baby a bottle know about paste bottle feeding. Uh, there's good videos on YouTube for paste bottle feeding, and like I said, there's a blog post about it as well on uh, vitalitynw.com. Um, let's see, I feel like I had another thing to say about giving the. Oh, okay. Um, oh, okay, another question. Can I pump while I'm commuting? You know, this is an interesting one. I've met so many breastfeeding mothers who do it, who do pump while commuting, um, particularly while driving. And you, yeah, you can. I can't necessarily recommend it. It's the most safe practice. <laughs> um, because, you know, I mean, you got to live your life, but you also never know when you're going to get rear-ended or what have you. Um, I would say one risk about the pumping and driving is that you're not going to be able to do that, those hands-on breast compressions, or I was going to mix it up and use the other breast here. So when you're doing that, when you're driving, obviously you can't be doing this kind of stuff. So you may find that it's not as effective, but it's better than nothing. Absolutely. If it's the only chance you get, then yeah, you know, I think I have every confidence that mothers will make it work. Like they'll, they'll do what it will make it work. So um, as far as on public transportation, um, there's no laws against it by any means. You have, pumping is kind of tricky. I, be, I don't believe any laws specifically state about using a breast pump in public, but I believe and would argue that it falls under the same umbrella as that breastfeeding individuals can breastfeed wherever they're allowed to be. So yeah, you can absolutely pub, pump on public transportation. Um, and you can decide your level of comfort with that and like how you want to do that. Um, I know somebody who had to pump at a concert at the zoo <laughs> and she had a really hard time finding an outlet to do it. Um, but we found one and she just used one of those covers, like a, like a nursing cover that, um, you know, you do that and then nobody knows what you're doing. And if they notice, you know, just 
if they ask questions, let them know that you're, you know, preparing milk for your baby because babies need to eat. So, um, let's see. Oh, I had one about the bottle. Okay. Another one that I hear often is, um, my baby won't take a bottle. How can I get my baby to take a bottle? And, you know, I, so in general, I think like babies that can take a bottle, like will, and if they're not taking a bottle, there may be a structural reason. It may be related to um, muscle tension or jaw tightness, or it may be related to oral restriction, restriction if any of those things haven't been um, resolved. There's a possibility that they may not be able to take a bottle because of that. But um, I also am of the opinion that babies are smart and babies don't may not always want to be taking their milk from something that's not their mom. So I think that it's important to, it is important to give some kind of that, that practice bottle a couple of times before you go back to work, just so they can kind of get accustomed to it. Again, it's that line where if you're not practicing pace bottle feeding, you do run that risk of, are you going to tip them into bottle preference? It's not nipple confusion. Nipple confusion is not a thing. Like they're not, confused about, wait, is this my mom or is this a bottle? Like they know, um, but they may, they may start to get some flow preference because bottles are faster and easier than breastfeeding for, you know, you, for some babies. Um, so if the baby's not taking a bottle, I would, I would consider that, I would take that into the, into the equation. Like, is there a reason why they're not taking, taking that bottle? And is it, is it structural, um, or something else? Um, and then, you know, if the baby is older, if they're four, five, six months old, it's kind of radical, but I would encourage a family to skip the bottle and start using a sippy cup or a straw, a soft spout, something like that. Um, and then I would, I would kind of see like what would work for that baby. There's no law saying that babies have to take bottles, period. Um, so if they're five months old and you're trying to introduce a bottle to them, you may have missed the window of like their ability to be able to kind of figure it out sort of. So it may not be the worst idea to try something different. Um, and of course I can help you with that, that it seems counterintuitive to a lot of families, especially if they're really accustomed to using bottles. Um, so if you have questions about that, don't hesitate to ask a lactation consultant because we can help you uh, with that as well. Um, and then also, you know, they may not take a ton out of the bottle because they are reverse cycling. And so, you know, if you get home and, and your care provider is like, well, they only ate like four ounces today, don't stress out. Like they're going to, they're going to make up for it probably. Um, and then if they don't, if you find that they're, they're like lethargic and they're sleeping too much and they're not having wet diapers and they're not pooping, then that is definitely something that should be, um, <clears throat> talk to the pediatrician or to a healthcare provider about. But, you know, usually, like, babies are going to eat when they're hungry. And so when they're reunited with mom, they're um, probably going to do that. <clears throat> Let's see. I'm trying to see if I can see how much time I have left. I have 12 minutes left. Okay. Um, let's see. What are other things that I hear about? This is such a common topic, and I feel like most, um, every time that I taught breastfeeding classes, like prenatal breastfeeding classes, this is what moms had questions about, or, or parents had questions about, because they, <clears throat> they can, like, they're so, they're so concerned about when they have to leave the baby, right? And what am I going to do then? And I just, you know, I like to take things one step at a time. So I say in that, in those first few weeks, get breastfeeding established, get your supply established. And then the, you know, the giving the bottles and the pumping will come later, hopefully. Um, a question about recommendations on cleaning and sanitizing pump parts. So uh, like I said before, they can be washed at the end of the day if your baby is a healthy full-term baby and isn't immunocompromised. Um, you can, you can do, you can sanitize them every day if you feel that, if you feel it's necessary, if you feel they are being potentially contaminated. Otherwise, I would probably just sanitize them once a week. Um, and so that would mean boiling the parts or using the little like micro steam bags. Um, I'm holding them up like I have them here. I don't. 
Um, there's like little bags that you can get from Medela that you can steam your, your pump parts in um, and that sanitizes them. Um, it doesn't need to be done super frequently. It does need to be done if you have an active like thrush infection. If you have a yeast infection, then you have to sanitize everything like all the time. So hopefully you won't have to deal with thrush and you won't have to go through that whole protocol because that does involve sanitizing any pump parts, any bottles, any pacifiers, anything like that that goes into the baby's mouth. Um, and then as far as cleaning the parts, warm soapy water is fine. Um, rinse them pretty thoroughly. You obviously don't want to have soap residue on them. Um, and then uh, laying them out to dry on a towel um, is, is uh, that's all you have to do. It's pretty, it's pretty simple. It's kind of time consuming. It's not, it's not really, it was ne certainly never my favorite part of the day, right? After the baby goes to bed to have to go wash the pump parts and put them together and all of that. Um, but as it's pretty straightforward as far as taking care of them. The tubing on your breast pump, it, your pump probably comes with the, with the tubes that connect the, um, motor to the flanges. Those do not need to be cleaned the same, like they don't need to be cleaned as part of your, your routine for cleaning them. Um, you may find that they start to get some condensation in them and you can run some rubbing alcohol through them. Um, or you can do, we used to, we used to call it like the, the whip, the rodeo whip. You go like this with it and that gets the condensation out, um, to help dry it a little bit. Um, let's see what else I highly recommend not, um, sharing pumps if they're an open system. Uh, like a Medela pump and style is an open system. Um, most of the ones that you get say from your insurance, um, are open systems, which means that there's potential for um, bacteria and contamination to happen inside the motor that we can't see. And like, I can't promise that there's not going to be, you know, a yeast infection in there or mold or um, things like that. Or sometimes milk can get back up into those tubes. So I highly recommend not using a used pump. Um, if it's a closed system, like say a hospital grade symphony um, or another type of closed system pump, those those can be used because they're they're meant to have multiple users. But um, if you have if your insurance covers a pump, which it's supposed to, uh, right now I would strongly recommend you take advantage of that and get yourself a brand new pump. How should I store the milk? Um, so. Glass is ideal when it comes to storing breast milk because it helps maintain the integrity of the breast milk itself best. Um, those storage containers are hard to come by, sort of. So um, if all you have is the BPA-free plastic, you know, say the collection containers that come from with your pump, then that's fine, of course. Um, so when you're pumping and then you're taking that home, taking that milk home to store, you can just leave it in your fridge um, towards the back. It's good in your fridge for about five days. Um, so as long as it's not on the door and then it hasn't been sitting out in your car or things like that, it's good for five days. Um, and then if you're freezing, if you find that you're pumping more milk than your baby is eating, you can freeze some of it. Um, you can use the, there's breast milk storage bags that are um, available for freezing. And I recommend doing about three to four ounces in those bags. Any more than that one, you run the risk of them expanding and leaking in your freezer. Um, and two, if you thaw six ounces and your baby only takes, you know, a three ounce bottle, that those next three ounces may not be good. They're only good for about five to six hours after that. So the next feed it may not be good, right? Um, so small amounts is, is how I recommend freezing your milk. Uh, and then storing it, it needs to be, um, it's good for five days in the refrigerator. It's good for about five or six months in the freezer um, and about five to six hours on the counter at room temperature. Again, it's, you know, it's almost 100 degrees here in Portland today, so I wouldn't leave it sitting out for too long. Um, and um, after it's thawed, if you pull it out of the freezer, it's good for 24 hours from when it has become liquid basically. So if there's still some frozen crystals in there, um, it's still good if it, so if it thaws, um, and then 24 hours from when it's thawed. Um, okay, great. 
oh, well, now I have unlimited minutes. So. <laughs> um, so I think that covers up for the storage. I'm sure I'm going to think later of all the things that I forgot to mention because it's such a big topic. I will say, I'll, I'll end on this. Um, I have two resources that I love to recommend to families. One is kellymom.com. And that's a website that's evidence-based and it's written by a board certified lactation consultant um, like myself who she does research, right? So it's not just like Googling information. Um, you're actually going to get like good information that is helpful. So kellymom.com is a great resource. And um, there's another one called Working Mother, sorry, Nursing Mother, Working Mother by Gail Pryor that uh, is a really great book for if you are returning to work outside the home. She goes, she goes really into depth in this topic and you can get some good information from that as well. Um, I found it to be super useful. I read it when I was pregnant, which was helpful. Um, and it definitely came in handy when I was pumping for my baby. Um, so if you ever have any questions about returning to work, I'm happy to do a, a specific returning to work outside the home or returning to school consult here at Vitality Northwest. Um, that's definitely an option. And peer to peer support is a really good one for this as well, because a lot of us have been there. Right. A lot of families have had to go back to work and are afraid that it's going to hurt the breastfeeding relationship. And the good news is, is that it doesn't have to, certainly. Um, if your goal is to continue breastfeeding for as long as it, your baby wants to, it can be done even if you're working, even if you're working full time. I know it's so daunting and we hear so many stories about, the, about families that couldn't make it work, and, um, which is really unfortunate. And very real, especially because our leave policy in this country is so abysmal, um, but it can be done. So with support and with resources, you can make it work for sure. Um, so that is all that I have to say about that. I'm sure I'll think of more things and um, there will be a blog post covering a lot of this information coming up on the Vitality Northwest website soon. And please don't hesitate to contact me if you have any more questions. Okay? <laughs> Thanks, you guys.